This Week on Waterways. Marine Zones and the Tortugas Ecological Reserve. The Florida Keys. This picturesque string of islands conjures up images of swaying palm trees and unforgettable sunsets. Yet it is most famous for the attractions beneath the waterline. The Keys are home to the world's third largest and North America's only barrier coral reef. Novice snorkelers and experienced scuba divers come from around the globe to discover the awe-inspiring beauty of the Keys Reef, which stretches from north of Key Largo west through the Dry Tortugas. The Coral Reef Ecosystem with its seagrass flats and mangrove fringed islands also supports a robust recreational fishing industry and almost 13 million pounds of commercial seafood landed annually in Monroe County. Keys waters are diverse, abundant, and seemingly limitless. But a calm sea can often hide trouble below the surface. Despite the aura of endlessness, the waters of the Keys are fragile, finite, and they have a long history of human influence. The Keys have changed immensely over the past century. To accommodate trains and later cars, island passes were filled and new islands were created, literally reshaping the Keys. To satisfy demand for waterfront property and accommodate a growing population, more than 124 miles of canals were dredged from the islands, a length almost as long as the entire overseas highway. During the development boom of the 1950s through 70s, many acres of tropical hardwood hammocks in the Florida Keys were cleared to provide land for housing and commercial development, and more than 50% of the historic mangrove habitat was eliminated. Over the last century, the Keys have been subject to overfishing of grouper, sea turtles, and queen conch, resulting in the listing of these species as endangered or protected. And since the 1970s, the Keys marine ecosystem has experienced mass die-offs of important species, long-spined sea urchins from disease and branching corals such as elkhorn and staghorn from disease, bleaching and hurricanes. In 1960, to address the declines in Keys coral reefs, John Pennycamp Coral Reef State Park was established off Key Largo as the world's first underwater park. Continued environmental concerns prompted the designation of Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary in 1975 and Lou Key National Marine Sanctuary in 1981. However, even after these sanctuaries were established, pollution, overfishing, physical impacts, and user conflicts continued to occur. And throughout the 80s, we started seeing all kinds of impacts on our coral reefs. We started seeing uh, degrading water quality. We were seeing increases in, in use of the resources. We were seeing more and more boaters in the Keys, and we were seeing more and more inexperienced boaters in the Keys. And that was resulting in a lot of vessel groundings on shallow reefs, on the seagrasses. Mounting threats to the health and future of the coral reef ecosystem in the Florida Keys would then prompt Congress to take action to further protect this fragile natural resource, one of the nation's great underwater treasures. Following three major ship groundings within 17 days in October and November of 1989, Congressman Dante Fussell from Florida worked with Senator Bob Graham to craft the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Protection Act. And in November of 1990, President Bush signed into law the first congressionally designated sanctuary. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. This new sanctuary 
incorporated the pre-existing Key Largo and Lou Key sanctuaries to protect 2,800 square nautical miles of spectacular, unique, and nationally significant marine resources. The sanctuary is home to the world's third largest barrier reef, extensive seagrass beds, more than 1,700 mangrove-fringed islands, and more than 6,000 species of marine life. It also preserves a part of our nation's history with countless shipwrecks and other archaeological treasures. This ecosystem is the marine equivalent of a tropical rainforest. It supports high levels of biological diversity but is fragile and easily susceptible to damage from human activities. One thing that was really key to this particular sanctuary is that Congress directed NOAA to consider spatial and temporal zoning to better ensure the protection of sanctuary resources. Marine zoning. Just as areas of land may be set aside for specific uses, so too can parts of the ocean. Marine zones can help protect sensitive natural resources from overuse, separate conflicting uses, and preserve the diversity of life and the integrity of habitat. In 1997, after numerous public meetings, workshops, and extensive public input, the sanctuary implemented its first management plan, which included the country's first comprehensive marine zoning plan, Later, in 2001, after an additional public process, the sanctuary boundary was expanded slightly and the Tortugas Ecological Reserve was added to the zone plan. Today, the sanctuary protects 2,900 square nautical miles and employs five different zone types, each with a specific purpose. Our sanctuary preservation areas are our smaller zones. They are set aside to protect heavily used areas like the top of Luke Key Reef, for example, where you have tens of thousands of divers every year that want to go and see the spectacular coral reefs, but they don't necessarily want to compete with spear fishermen, with marine life collectors, or boats trolling over them. The second type of no-take area are the research-only areas. This is a special uh, marine zoning type that we've established in this sanctuary to set aside areas for research, research only. So by having the existing management areas, we not only recognize their authority and their jurisdiction, and the rules and regulations that exist through other entities, but we also complement them by providing sanctuary regulations that they can use in, in their areas. So together, we integrate our management in the existing management areas. The wildlife management areas bird rookeries, bird nesting areas, turtle beaches. There are some really special resources surrounding the Florida Keys. What we have done with the wildlife management areas is set a buffer around many of the islands where most of them are uh, restricted as far as vessel use. The fifth and largest type of zone used by the sanctuary are ecological reserves. Ecological reserves protect an entire range of marine habitats, protecting natural spawning, nursery, and permanent residence areas needed for sustainable population of marine life and the coral reef community. A lot of people think the larger ecological reserves will benefit fisheries in various ways, but we set them aside to protect the biodiversity of the area. We want to protect the food, the home, the habitat of all the recreationally and commercially important species, but also the little blennies and gobies that just make a living there. Parceling areas of water for specific uses is a task not taken lightly or quickly. 
The creation of new conservation strategies and marine zones takes place through a public process that can take years. In creating these new strategies and zones, the Sanctuary and its Advisory Council consider scientific research and community input, as well as how these new rules would affect the environment and the economy. The last thing we did there was draw lines on maps, not the first thing. But we spent a lot of time educating or explaining what we knew and didn't know. We had oceanographers, we had fishermen talk about their experience and what they catch and where they catch it, what areas they need. We had lobstermen, we had recreational anglers, we had divers, we had conservation oriented type people. These are the things that they wanted. And then we set some criteria and actually the last thing they did was uh, develop reserves. Turned out to be uh, 200 square miles, which is huge. And at that time, it's the largest no-take areas in the United States. With the creation of the Sanctuary's network of marine zones in 1997, and the addition of the Tortugas Ecological Reserve in 2001, the real work had only just begun. I think whenever you tell people that they can no longer go to some uh, a location and do what they have traditionally done, uh, you're going to meet res with resistance. That's, uh, that's human nature and, and should be expected. And I think that when we do that, we owe it to the public, to those people who are impacted by our management decisions, to show that those decisions were wise. To prove the decisions were wise, there would need to be a comparison of research from before and after the implementation of marine zones. These research projects help determine whether the marine zones are meeting their intended goals and whether ecological reserves are succeeding in protecting habitat and biodiversity. Some zone monitoring projects compare how much coral is present inside and outside a marine zone and how that level has changed over the years. Other researchers look at reef fish and how their size and population might differ inside a zone or outside. Results from these studies help sanctuary managers understand how to better utilize marine zones to protect the special resources of the Florida Keys. Coral reefs are integrated ecosystems that depend both on fish and, and how much seaweed that they eat and the predators that eat the organisms that live on the bottom, as well as the actual animals and plants that live on the bottoms themselves. The balance between the amount of coral that's out there, the amount of seaweed, and the amount of bare, bare space is telling you about the health of the reef. The good news is that the amount of seaweed, which is on the bottom in the Florida Keys National Marine, Marine Sanctuaries is actually quite low and it's among the lowest around the Caribbean and that is probably because of the protections that are afforded to fish that eat those seaweeds, particularly two kinds of fish called parrotfish and surgeonfish. The results that, that we've been coming up with and, and the results from other studies that are running in tandem with ours are telling us that the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is effective. It's got more fish and less seaweed than a lot of places around the Caribbean, and that is a perfect concoction to recover the corals in the Keys Sanctuary, and in particular, in the marine protected areas within the Keys. Coral reefs, because they are slow growing and affected by so many factors, take longer to show a response to marine zone protection. Fish, on the other hand, respond more quickly to protection. And through long-term monitoring, scientists have been able to more quickly detect changes in their populations. Much of this research has been focused on the sanctuary's crown jewel. The Tortugas Ecological Reserve, located more than 70 miles west of Key West, is separated into north and south. Entrance into Tortugas South is limited to permitted researchers, and access to the Tortugas North is controlled through a simple no-fee permit. This 151 square nautical mile reserve is closed to all consumptive use, including fishing and anchoring. More than 400 species of reef fish live here, including all species of grouper. And the coral here is healthier and more abundant than anywhere else in the Florida Keys. Fishing and anchoring are prohibited to help preserve biodiversity and protect coral reef habitats. 
the marine reserves, it's an ecosystem-based management approach. You're trying to not just address one, one fish species or one coral species. You're trying to improve the, the health of the whole ecosystem by you know, taking the pressure off, off that area and giving it a chance to function like it, like it would if it was left on its own. Since 1999, two years before the reserve's establishment, scientists from the University of Miami and NOAA's fisheries, and more recently, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, have been conducting surveys of Tortugas reef fish to study how zone protection affects certain fish. Together, scientists have undertaken thousands of scuba dives to collect information on reef fish size, species, abundance, and habitat preference. The Tortugas Ecological Reserve has had, had a quite di uh, dramatic impact on, on the diversity of fishes. This is most obvious in those uh, fishes that are heavily exploited. Um, we've seen the reappearance of the two groupers, the Goliath grouper and the Nassau grouper, that were listed as threatened. Uh, both of those have reappeared in our accounts. Uh, we've seen a number of other species that were rare uh, are now relatively common. It's just dramatic. I mean, you don't even have to ask a scientist. The divers have been out there will tell you that before and after they've seen the difference. But just for example, a couple figures. Uh, red grouper increased the peak 50-fold uh, over what they were, 50 times the density of population. Uh, black grouper increased 30 times the, the, the density of the population. Yellowtail snapper, one of the most important fishes in the Keys in terms of the, the quantity and commercial and recreational fishing increased uh, 400 percent. The Tortugas Reserve, not only the Tortugas Reserve, but the entire Tortugas region is important to South Florida uh, on the Florida Keys because, it's, uh, it's an, because of its location. It's upstream from the rest of the, our, the Keys uh, and, and Miami uh, and the, the east coast of Florida. So it's important for recruitment purposes because water all flows from, from west to east in this region. Uh, it's considered a very important source uh, of fisheries recruits to the rest of the South Florida area. The gathering, or aggregating, of fish for spawning purposes makes them easy prey for anglers. Over time, fishermen have learned to time their trips to those lunar cycles when fish gather, sometimes by the thousands. Catching fish during a spawn can be like shooting fish in a barrel. Over the years, Tortugas anglers began reporting declines in the once abundant aggregation of species like mutton snapper. These reports contributed to the protection of the Tortugas Ecological Reserve and the spawning grounds of Riley's Hump. Scientific surveys would confirm that aggregations had been depleted, but they began to document how reserve protection would affect and hopefully benefit these fish aggregations. So visual surveys had showed that the aggregation had, um, had been significantly uh, depleted, if not it ceased to exist. Um, they were seeing, uh, you know, single fish, solitary fish, tens of fish in the early, in, the, in around 2000, when they should have been seeing thousands and thousands of fish out there. In 2009, eight years after the Tortugas Ecological Reserve was created, scientists observed a long-awaited site. The first scientifically documented mutton snapper spawning aggregation at Riley's Hump. We were out there doing the surgeries on the bottom when one afternoon uh, there was just thousands of fish. But uh, other researchers had been going out to Riley's Hump and monitoring the population of, of spawning fish at Riley's for a number of years and had slowly seen <clears throat> an increase from 10 to hundreds of fish at a time. But um, this summer we, we estimate somewhere around 4,000 fish were, were gathered out there to spawn. And since then, we've seen dramatic increases in, in uh, adult fish all throughout the Keys in South Florida. And I think that's partially attributed to 
uh, these no-take areas, protecting the spawning aggregations, mainly at Riley's Hump, but also we also uh, increased the uh, minimum size limits in a period of time, and we, which allowed some of these fish to, to grow larger and, and reproduce. And we reduced the bag limits, how many people could take. So all these in, in total really result in a very successful increase in production of fish. So there's actually more fish for people despite these regulations. I think it would be safe to say that the, the, the Keys and fishermen in the Keys would directly benefit from spawning events in this marine protected area. We're not only focused on mutton snapper, we're, trying, we're looking at yellowtail snapper, we're looking at black grouper. We're using acoustic telemetry methods to determine where fish, you know, go during the day, what their, their daily routine is, and then seasonally, um, how they move with changes in temperature, you know, during spawning season, where do they go. In 2007, the National Park Service established the Dry Tortugas National Park Research Natural Area within Dry Tortugas National Park. This 34 square nautical mile reserve was created next to the Tortugas Ecological Reserve North to provide complementing protection for the habitat and marine life that call the Tortugas region home. Long-term research by NOAA, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and the University of Miami has studied the size, movements, and population dynamics of commercially important fish species inside the sanctuary's ecological reserve. The park's research natural area and adjacent areas open to fishing. Research shows that fish such as mutton and yellowtail snapper and black grouper are larger and more abundant inside the reserves as well as the surrounding areas open to fishing, suggesting the phenomenon known as spillover where larger fish from protected areas will migrate outside the reserve's boundaries where they are available to be caught. Additional research, using acoustic telemetry, has studied the movements of fish outfitted with special acoustic tags. This research relies on a network of underwater acoustic receivers that receive a signal when a tagged fish swims by, much like how modern electronic toll booths register when cars with toll passes travel near them. This array of acoustic receivers has been used by researchers to identify an unprotected migration corridor for mutton snapper traveling between protected spawning grounds in the sanctuary's reserve and foraging grounds in the park's reserve. This long-term monitoring is vital and provides coral reef managers with the science needed to protect America's great underwater treasures for future generations. This is part of our natural resources, the entire country owns these resources and the point of the marine sanctuary is to recover them so that we can all have them and enjoy them and use them in a sustainable way along into the future for our children, grandchildren and further on down the line. No matter where people live, they can do something to help us with marine zones. And in fact, everyone has a role in helping us protect America's only living barrier coral reef. If you live in middle America, think about the things that are affecting the water quality. Think about the watershed and think about what you can do locally to support healthy, clean ecosystems coming downstream. In 2012, the sanctuary, its advisory council, and the community began a review and reevaluation of sanctuary marine zones and regulations. Just as the public had helped shape the sanctuary's management plan, original marine zones, and the Tortugas Ecological Reserve, they will again be enlisted in an update of those conservation tools. This multi-year public process will look at whether sanctuary rules and marine zones are sufficient to address the threats to Keys marine resources, or whether new or different strategies are needed. This adaptive management is a critical tool that helps us respond to changing influences and emerging threats to get involved in the process and how you can provide public input to help shape Florida Keys marine conservation for the future, visit floridakeys.noaa.gov. There's an immediate reaction for fishermen around the coastal communities to immediately think that this is about them or that this is to prohibit their activities, but it's not. It's really to help them. It's to help the next generations. 
When I'm thinking about the Tortuga Seacolotch Reserve, I'm thinking about my grandchildren's grandchildren that will be able to catch more mutton snapper. They will be able to see fish that I used to see in the 1960s in the Florida Keys. They will be able to see environments like I enjoyed as a child once again.